So uh, today I will be presenting the evolution and scaling of feature store at Uber. Uh, basically, um, I'm the Venaga. Um, I work in feature engineering team at Uber, and we manage the features, um, how to scale them, how to serve them, the feature store architecture in details. And before going into all the details, I would be going into the different terminologies I'm going to use in this talk. So this is my team. Uh, we basically manage everything around feature infrastructure at Uber. Uh, so this is the agenda for today's talk. Um, we will be learning what uh, machine learning, what, what a feature is, how the features get generated, uh, how do we store them, how do we share them across different models, and some feature store operations like offline serving, online serving, model training, uh, feature transformations, uh, we'll go into the details of uh, all of these. So this is a machine learning model. Uh, this is basically a very high level overview. We have a data, we have a model. Uh, we use that data to train the model and then we, we serve predictions uh, for this model. And then once we serve, whatever data we get in return, which goes back into the loop, and then models get retrained with the new data. And the online and offline here is the data which is used at the training time. We call it like offline serving. So if I say offline serving or serving at training time, they are the same thing. And online serving is basically serving at the prediction time. So this is uh, event data and features. So this is basically what event data looks like. You have certain orders coming into the system. We basically do some aggregations and transformations, and then we, we generate features based on that. So for example, like uh, in, in the left table, we have two orders received on 9th, and then the right table denotes uh, how many orders you received on, on that particular date. So that's the difference between the raw data and what features eventually look like. Um, at Uber, we have two primary type of features. One is like batch features and real-time features. Batch features which has very uh, low granularity. For example, um, if you want to say, hey, how many orders uh, this store received in last one day or last 30 days or last 15 days, that's a batch feature, which is like large data processing. Uh, we process all this data on a daily basis, and then we store this data. And real times are more, uh, uh, as the name suggests, it's a real time information. Uh, for example, what is the activity happening in last one minute, or two minutes, or last five minutes, uh, one hour, uh, anything which is less than a day, up to a granularity of a minute. So it's basically a continuous stream of data which we ingest into our stores and serve for predictions. Feature structure is, uh, this is how we basically store features. Uh, the reason to, to do this in a way is uh, we have like tens of thousands of features and managing each feature is difficult. So we basically group them probably at a different entity level. So an uh, entity can be anything, basically a Uber entity. For example, stores, eaters, orders, um, are different things. So pallet, feature store, this is what we call Uber's feature store. Uh, so feature store is not just limited to serving and collecting the data. Uh, there are a lot of other things we do as part of feature store, which is like uh, making sure features are shared across different models, uh, automatic feature selection, managing the streaming, ETL pipelines, data monitoring, data quality, uh, feature transformations, uh, all these are also part of this huge uh, pallet store or feature store infrastructure. Uh, these are just some numbers, uh, what we do and what we manage. So we have like tens of thousands of features. We have hundreds of million of QPS we serve. Uh, we serve at like at P99 is less than 10 milliseconds, so our SLAs are pretty tight there. Thousands of feature pipelines, hundreds of terabytes of data per training for a single model. Now, to manage the scale, uh, 
moving forward, I'll just go through different scalability problems we have seen and how we overcome those challenges. So this is just a very uh, high level architecture. I have abstracted out more details from here, but this is basically what it's lo it looks like. We have streaming and aggregation jobs. Uh, those jobs will get real time data, perform the aggregations, then the data will be ingested to Kafka. From there, we have an uh, ingestion service, which will write this Kafka data into Cassandra. And we also have a Hive ingestion, which will write the same data to a Hive table. And for batch features, uh, we have like large uh, aggregation queries. So those compute job will run. They will write the data to Hive. And from Hive, we will basically disperse that data back to Cassandra. So this way, we make sure that both batch and streaming data remains available in both uh, offline and online stores from where we serve it for training application and inference. So problems at scale, uh, we divide these problems into four parts. Uh, feature onboarding, offline serving, online serving, and online offline consistency. Uh, basically, how do we onboard hundreds of features uh, with such a small team? How do we perform these large joins? How do we serve hundreds of millions of QPS and manage the infrastructure around that? What is offline, offline consistency, and how do we resolve these problems? So let's talk about feature onboarding. Uh, in order to onboard hundreds of features, the, the first thing we realize is that we need to reduce the intervention from our team and make the platform as self-serve as possible. So what we have done to do that is we have basically automated everything in this architecture. So what user can do whenever they want to get a new feature or a feature group, they simply write a JSON config. So they will update the JSON config, and then we run some validations on these JSON, con JSON configs that everything is correct and it is not breaking the existing stuff. And once th all those checks are done, this JSON config will, be, will go to production, and this is what it will do. So, this JSON config we will, will basically trigger a set of jobs. So it will trigger the ingestion jobs, it will trigger the uh, dispersal jobs, it will trigger the data quality test, it will also trigger monitoring, alerting. So all these things will basically be automated. The green ones are which are basically automated and the yellow ones which are uh, mostly self-serve. So for example, once you, your feature is ready, you have trained your model, then you can create your inference server on your own, which and it, you can just start sending prediction requests. So you don't really need uh, much from us uh, at the time of uh, batch feature onboarding. So this automation basically allowed us to reduce our overhead for, for our team and basically give a better customer experience to our users. The second problem uh, I'll go into details is offline serving. So what is offline serving? Uh, basically, this is a very high level overview of what offline serving looks like. So we have certain features, and we have base data. Base data is also like your labels and compute configs, because we need to run Spark job to, to perform all these large joins. So we take all these um, information as an input. We pass it to the orchestrator, which eventually starts a Spark job. Uh, this Spark job will run uh, some set of joins, basically. It will join the base data with your features, and then it will generate a training data set. And that training data set is used by the ML models. So this is what its structure looks like. Um, now, the fundamental problems with offline serving is these, like how to speed up the joins. How do you do a cascading join over hundreds of terabytes of data? Um, how to reduce out of memory spark errors, how to make it easy for users to write optimal smart spark configs, and how to reuse computations. Um, even when we do all those optimizations, some jobs do fail. How do we make sure that, uh, how do we basically reuse all the computations which we have already done in the past and not do them again? So there are four, uh, fundamental optimizations we have done for our offline serving infrastructure. Uh, the first is batching. 
So in order to understand batching, we need to go into the details of like Spark uh, sort merge join. So when we join two tables, basically Spark will do a lot of data shuffling and then it will make sure all the similar data are available on same executors, then it will perform a join between them and then it will return you the output. So when you, when you perform a join for a large data set, these kind of jobs become more uh, failure prone and it's more, it's easy to get like, your job will be either out of memory or out of disk. So what we have done is we have done a batching optimization. So let's say you want to perform a join between 30 days of data and it's too large to handle. So we can divide this data into smaller batches and then we just process these batches one by one. We can test on these batches, fine tune the configs for these batches. Uh, the jobs become more manageable. Uh, the next thing we have done is auto config. Um, what we have seen in the past is that it's not very really easy to configure a Spark job correctly. Uh, the reason for that is uh, basically you need three things to run a join operation. You need feature, you need the labels, you need the compute configs. Uh, in order to write the correct compute configs, uh, what you need to know first is how does Spark operate and what are the Spark configs which can actually impact your job? For example, like how many shuffle partitions to have, how many cores to assign per task, um, how does Spark handle shuffle, da shuffle data, how does it cleans them up, all these things, and then you can write optimal compute configs to run the job. So we have seen in the past that a lot of our customers, they're not able to write these configs correctly, hence a lot of their jobs uh, failed due to this. Now, what we have done is we have written an auto config module. Uh, what auto config module does is it takes all these input parameters and it will look at your features, it will look, look at your labels, it will figure out how large we, how large data sets you are joining at the end and it also knows what kind of code we are performing or what kind of operations we are performing. Based on that, it will modify the compute config on flight. If it thinks that these compute config will not work and you need more resources, it will automatically update your compute config to have more resources to make sure that your job runs successfully. And if it thinks that the compute configs you have provided is a lot and you don't need as many resources, then it will basically reduce the resources to make sure that the resources are optimized. Uh, the next thing we would go into the details of incremental join. So uh, we have seen batching before. Uh, so when we, we basically perform a cascading join, so this is what your join looks like. Uh, a model can be trained on multiple features. Uh, each feature can belong to a different table. So we basically get all these table and then we join them with your uh, basis or base or label data set. So what happens is every time uh, Spark joins, these tables, it will join, shuffle both the tables, then return the output. It will reshuffle output and feature table two, then again do the join and then returns the final output. And this operation happens for every batch. And then this is what it looks like. Once it has done all these operations for every batch, we do a union at the end and we return the join data set. Now, what is the problem with this? Uh, the way uh, Spark works is it will not delete the data until it has the lineage of the data uh, in the job, which means that until the union is finished, it will keep all the shuffled data around in either memory or disk. And this requires a lot of data to remain uh, in your memory or disk. So you need a lot of resources to perform the join between these jobs. Uh, what we have done to overcome this issue is we basically removed this union. This is what we call uh, incremental join or incremental materialization. So instead of keeping all these da shuffled data, we simply persist this data per batch and we specifically go and delete all the shuffles. So what basically you can do is the only resource you need to run a large join is as much as a batch. The downside of this is that your job can be slow because now we are adding this extra step of writing to HDFS, but it does make large data set jobs more reliable. Uh, we anyway write this data to HDFS and I, I'll go into the details why we do that at the moment. 
but this basically allowed us to run our jobs more reliably. You can perform literally a join worth one year of data, and that join would still succeed. Uh, the next optimization we have done around uh, join operation is resume job. Uh, so what is resume job? So let's say you are, you are performing a join with a large data set um, worth like a month or three months, and your job went halfway through and then it failed. It can fail for multiple reasons, external dependencies, power configuration, someone else took your disk which you were using, hundreds of reasons. Um, so what we provide a functionality to resume the job. So basically you divide into batches, you performed some of the batches and then this failed. Uh, you can retry the same job and we keep this data, I think as I showed, we persist this data in HDFS and then you can just resume your job from where it actually failed. So we keep these checkpoints. So this allows us to basically not recompute a lot of data uh, when not required. So this is further optimizations we have done to make sure or to run our uh, feature preparation more reliably. Next we will look into the online serving. Uh, so this is what the online serving looks like. Basically you have, whenever you open Uber Eats app, you will, you will see some restaurants and for each restaurant or your recommendations, there are like tens of models which are being used and each of that model is using tens of features. So this fan out increase exponentially for us. That is what causes hundreds of millions of QPS uh, in feature store. So this is a high level overview of our online serving. Uh, probably I think this is literally like every standard serving diagram. So you ingest the data and that the data is being served. So we will look into the optimization on two fronts. Uh, how do we optimize the ingestion and how do we optimize the serving? Uh, let's first go into the feature ingestion. So there are like, here we have listed four things, but uh, the, all the dispersals, dispersal is basically reading data from Hive and writing to Cassandra or any online store. And caching is um, caching the data during online serving. So we'll go into the dispersals one by one. Uh, first thing is efficient dispersal. So we, we basically utilize again uh, Spark to disperse this, read this data from Hive and write to SS tables. Now, if you just run a Spark job, and write this data to SS tables, what ends up happening is every Spark executor will write all this data to uh, every Cassandra uh, cluster, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, every Cassandra node. Hence, uh, this causes a lot of uh, small files, data fragmentation issues, uh, and many more. So we basically rely, what we do is we have basically mirrored the uh, partitioning strategy of Spark and Cassandra which allows us to write data to specific SS tables and then only uh, not have a lot of fragmentation uh, within our system. The, the second part is delta dispersal. Um, so the delta dispersal is basically whenever, you, whenever the new events are coming in, what our users do is they take the snapshot of the data and then for every day they would basically uh, for every day they will take the snapshot of data and they will write it to Cassandra and disperse it from Hive. Uh, in Delta, what we can do is, instead of writing everything or the full snapshot to Cassandra, you can only write the data which actually changed. So in these two tables you can see that we don't really need to disperse the data which happened on day two and day three, uh, part of data on day three, and we can only write which actually changed. So this reduces the, the size of dispersal significantly. So right now we do this on a row basis. So if there is no change in your row, we would basically uh, disperse it. Another optimization which is on the same lines for data dispersal, which is in the pipeline and uh, we haven't really started on it, but we, can, we are also planning to do it at a column level changes. So what ends up happening is when you aggregate the data over a long period and there are a lot of different types of feature in the same group, Every row will more or less change every day. Hence, 
uh, when you do the column level changes and dispersers, that is more optimized as compared to just uh, row, low, row level dis uh, differences. The next thing is selective dispersals. Um, so we have an offline store which is Hive, and we have an online store which is Cassandra. So what ends up happening is not all the models want all the features available in every store. So sometimes we disperse the same feature group into multiple clusters uh, due to isolation or different SLA requirements. And at that point, we don't want to disperse everything everywhere. So we allow doing selective dispersals. So what you can do is you take certain uh, features and instead of dispersing everything, you can only disperse the features you are actually using in your model. So this optimizes the dispersals, um, reduces the dispersal size significantly, and it also optimizes storage cost. Uh, the last part in online serving optimizations is caching. Basically, caching is more or less uh, straightforward. I think we have local cache, Redis cache, and Cassandra. So if your data set cardinality is low, for example, if you are using uh, city level features where you, we only have like few thousand cities, then we can just locally cache it. Uh, local cache mostly comes for free because we use the memory of uh, infinite servers. Um, if you have hundreds of GB of data, probably like a store level feature, then we use Redis. And if it is an eater level feature or maybe a driver level feature where we have millions or billions of rows, in that case, we use Cassandra. So it's basically the local cache in Redis is much, much cheaper than Cassandra. So this helps us in optimizing the cost for Cassandra. Uh, online, offline consistency. So let's first understand what is off online, offline consistency is. Um, in this diagram, there are like batch features and real-time features. So when you train a model and you, you give some data, which was, let's say you train a model based on yesterday's data, then when we serve the model, we also need to provide yesterday's data. Then only the expectations of the model will match with the data. And the same thing happens for real time as well. If you train the model based on last minute's data, then at serving time, you also need to serve last minute's data. So let's understand this with an example. Um, so let's say you trained a model and you wanted to predict how many orders a particular store will get today. And you created the model which uses uh, data from yesterday, so September 2 to September 3. Now, when your model is already trained, it is ready for serving, then this is what happens. So you are serving on 9th September, and the data which the model is expecting is from September 7 to September 8. But we cannot serve September 7 to September 8 data because we don't have it. It takes some time for data to get ingested in the pipeline. Uh, there are some ingestion delays or the large data sets can take few hours to get fully ingested in Cassandra. So instead, we serve basically what we have available, which would be a previous day, September 6 to September 7. So this creates a consistency issue between online and offline models. Um, now, how do you resolve this? One way to resolve this is just train your model with probably further old data. So instead of training for with yesterday's data, you train with day before yesterday's data. But with some models, it's not always possible, and they want more fresh data uh, for serving. So it's more like a compromise between if you want higher consistency or if you want more freshness. So for example, like if you are doing, if your model is doing a fraud detection, then you want more fresh data, and you can potentially compromise on consistency. So to do this, we allow users to get time shift features. Uh, so when we serve the features, we, we take uh, the feature name as an input, and you can also give us how shifted data you want in time. So for example, uh, time shift zero, which is basically we'll just say, oh, give me you know previous day's data, so then we can send the time shift zero. Day before that, it would be time shift one and time shift two and so on. You can get either of these. You can actually request all these time shift features. Uh, it works the same for both batch and real time feature, except in real time feature, this time shift is in minutes instead of 
in days for batch it's in days so you can just say hey give me the activity of xyz for last minute or for last 5 minutes or for last 10 minutes and you can keep shifting and then based on all those parameters you can make predictions so that's how we basically resolve online offline online offline consistency and the model owners can make a decision what they want to do uh, or what they want to have uh, more. So feature metadata and data quality, uh, as I said, uh, apart from uh, online offline serving, we also utilize Uber's data quality framework to make sure that all the feature pipelines are running on time, uh, the data which is being generated is 100% correct, uh, how to detect failures early in the process, how to enforce accountability, who owns this data, who to send alert when something fails. So there are four components of feature metadata and data quality. The first thing is unified metadata. Uh, so we have a metadata store where you can find every information about a feature, like where, who owns this feature, how this feature is being generated, what is the type of feature, where is this feature stored, how do you, on, uh, where is it available online, offline, what are the pipelines this feature is being generated, lineage, what all pipelines this feature, uh, these feature pipelines depends on. If it's an offline feature, you will see this kind of lineage graph where uh, you will see all the tables it depends on. If it's a real-time feature, then you will see a set of jobs that this is the job which is generating this set of data. Uh, the tiering of a feature is basically based on the use cases. Um, for example, uh, if a particular feature is being used in a very critical use cases, then it would be tiered one. We have from tier one to tier five, uh, where tier five is the lowest criticality. And based on what tier your feature is, we register different data quality tests. Again, this framework is automated. Um, the tiers get updated automatically. So for example, you have a feature group uh, which is being used in a model, which is a tier one model. So the, all the tiers will get updated automatically based on what type of model is using those features. So they will get downgraded automatically, they will get upgraded automatically. And whenever this upgrade or downgrade happens, the tests will also change. So for tier one features, we have more uh, higher SLA requirements. Uh, the, the SLA will be more strict. For example, it has to be fresh, it has to be complete. Uh, the data loss should be zero, the duplication should be zero, and all those kind of SLAs uh, need to be in place. But we don't enforce the same SLAs or same tests for uh, low tier, probably like tier four, tier five feature groups. So apart from that, like metadata and data quality, what we also have is feature store search. Um, due to having too many features, it becomes difficult to uh, search these feature or manually navigate to these features. So what we have is a, is a search store. You can basically search based on your entity, feature group, uh, feature specific name. You can search based on their databases, sources, a lot of different key features. And these are some of the areas we are exploring, basically um, embedding vector data type support. Till now we did not have uh, any vector data type support for feature store. So we are adding that better storage. Uh, I think uh, in general in feature store, the way the data doesn't really change very frequently. Uh, once the data is ingested in online store, uh, there are no updates possible. So it's mostly immutable. Uh, so we are looking into potential solutions of uh, immutable key value stores which can be used to lower down the cost of Cassandra or if it can be replaced with something else. Uh, feature versioning. Uh, feature versioning is again part of the same effort. Uh, what ends up happening is when you store some data in any uh, key value store, you need to assign some sort of TTLs and if your feature pipelines fails due to any reason, the data will basically time out and then you won't have anything to serve. Instead, what we would probably prefer to have is a versioning system where one version of the feature remains until the new version is available. So we always have something to uh, so. 
Uh, then feature intelligence, we do have automatic feature search. Uh, we want to enhance this further and near real-time features, which is aggregation infra and backfills. Uh, by aggregation infra, we mean is, so right now we rely on uh, external frameworks to do the aggregations for us for real-time feature, like we have Flink, Athena, you can write any custom job in Flink and then you can generate the data to Kafka. Uh, we want to provide uh, aggregation framework as part of feature store, which can allow you to do basic aggregation with uh, JSON configurations and backfills. Again, it's not uh, very, we do have backfills for batch features, but it's not very straightforward to have uh, backfills for real time features. So that is another work in the pipeline we have. Uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Any question? Okay. Could you talk more about? Could you talk more about how uh, the recent advances in vector space and embeddings tie into your legacy feature store systems? Oh, sorry. Can you? Rip I did not heard the last part of the question. So I'm, I just want to know how the recent vector databases and vector embeddings and their popularity, um, given their popularity, how they tie in with legacy systems like you demoed today. Okay. So uh, I think the way they tie with the legacy systems is when we added like embeddings, we also had to add support for embedding types. So till now, like all the stores we are using, we, we don't really have a support for array type data types. And most of the embeddings are like set of arrays. So what we were doing till now is taking them as a in string input and at the time of serving, we will basically transform this string into a list of parameters. So that is not very optimal and that is also what causes a lot of latency issues uh, at runtime. So now, as we see that more and more use cases want to use embeddings. So what we have seen a shift is more efforts moving into the direction of some sort of embedding store where people can reuse embeddings, they can store the embeddings uh, in their native format. So we are exploring multiple uh, different databases, vector databases. Uh, we already have an in-house solution called SIA to serve embeddings. So we are exploring all those options to create a new storage system for that. Okay. I think that's it, no more questions. Okay, thanks everyone.